Hello and welcome everyone. This is Active Lab guest stream number 16.2. It is June 11th, 2022. We're here with Mark Solms. This is the second part in our discussion. We had an awesome part one. Today we are going to have a recap on some of the points that were addressed in the first part in 16.1 and then we're going to head into some unexplored territory. So Mark, thanks so much for joining for these sessions, and please take it away. Thanks, Daniel. Glad to be here again. Um, I, I was just uh, testing out sharing my screen a minute ago, and it seems as if I'm incapable of showing you my face and sharing my screen at the same time. So take a good look at me. You're not going to see me for a while. Uh, here comes my screen. Please, God. There we are. Great. Uh, and here comes my pointer. There we are. And here's my title. Um, the emphasis is on physiological and philosophical considerations rather than computational ones. Um, so I'll start with a brief recap. Um, I made a few claims. Um, and uh, I didn't get to the end of the, this list. Um, so I will just remind you what those claims were, and then I will pause when I get to the point that we stopped at last time, which was here, that affect is an extended form of homeostasis. I started with the claim, which really is the main claim um, of, my, of my presentation. It is that affect, feeling, is the foundational form of consciousness and that it is intrinsically conscious. Um, I quoted Freud, uh, who more than anyone else uh, introduced the notion into mental science that mental processes are not in intrinsically conscious, that much of our cognitive processing goes on unconsciously. Um, even he made this point, the point that I'm making, uh, which, uh, in his words, was that it is surely of the essence of an emotion that we should be aware of it. That is, that it should become known to consciousness. Thus, the possibility of the attribute of unconsciousness would be completely excluded as emotions, feelings, and affects are concerned. And I emphasize the word feelings uh, because there's a whole lot of reasons why some people claim that there are such things as unconscious emotions and unconscious affects. So just to be absolutely clear what I'm talking about here, I'm talking about feeling. Uh, and you can't have an unconscious feeling. In other words, you can't have a feeling that you don't feel. So whatever uh, might be meant by unconscious emotions and unconscious affects, um, they're, they're, they can't apply to feelings. They can't be unconscious feelings. But uh, that might sound like a semantic point, uh, just a matter of words, that you can't have a feeling that you don't feel. It's an oxymoron. Uh, so I then went on to uh, set out various reasons, empirical ones, uh, why uh, the claim that feelings are intrinsically conscious uh, also has a solid empirical basis. Um, I drew attention to this discovery that was made in 1949 already, that the brain mechanisms for consciousness itself, in other words, what wakes us up uh, and, uh, in the morning uh, and, and puts us to sleep at night, the sort of switching on and off of the lights of consciousness, uh, that this is the business of the reticular activating system. The reticular activating system uh, is the brain system for arousing consciousness, for activating uh, cortical processes and rendering them conscious. I also mentioned the periaqueductal gray, uh, which plays a, 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 a and also it also plays a crucial part in all of this, um, together with the reticular activating system. But I'll come back to that later. For now, let's just focus on the reticular activating system. To give you a sense of what I mean by how uh, these structures, uh, their, their intrinsic function uh, is the switching on of the lights of consciousness, uh, I, I pointed out that you can make a lesion 
or you can suffer a lesion as small as two cubic millimeters in size uh, in the parabrachial complex of the reticular activating system. Uh, in other words, a lesion the size of a match head, and that is enough in human beings reliably to obliterate consciousness entirely. So I was saying, uh, let's look at these structures um, if we're wanting to understand something of the intrinsic consciousness generating uh, mechanisms of the brain. And um, I made the point uh, that if the cortex, uh, which is where we normally shine our light in terms of looking for the neural correlates of consciousness, if the cortex were the seat of consciousness, um, then there's an easily testable prediction, uh, which is that if you uh, have a case in which there is no cortex, uh, then the patient should not be conscious. Not so. Therefore, I showed you one such case. Uh, this is one uh, representative example of its type, uh, that here is a patient uh, born with no cortex, uh, the condition is called hydranencephaly. Uh, here you see in an MRI scan of her brain uh, that where cortex should be, there is just cerebrospinal fluid. And you see that her brain stem is perfectly intact. So uh, on the view that this brain stem area is where the consciousness is generated, that it doesn't require cortex, uh, this is a critical case. Uh, on the brain stem view, she should be conscious. Uh, on the cortical view, she should not. And here she is, and she's conscious, as you can see. Uh, she wakes up in the morning, she goes to sleep at night. Uh, in this sense, the, the lights are on. Uh, but much more interestingly, uh, she's not merely blankly awake. Uh, she, her, 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 her wakefulness has a content and a quality. Uh, and the quality that I'm talking about is affective quality. You see how she responds to her baby brother being placed on her lap. She responds with some form of pleasure. Um, and so there's a, there's a content to this mental state and a quality to this mental state that she's displaying. Um, why that's important is because when we first learned uh, in 1949, that the reticular activating system is prerequisite for all consciousness, that there's no such thing as cortical consciousness without brainstem arousal of the cortex. Now, we had the view that the cortex provides the qualities and the contents of consciousness, and the reticular activating system merely, merely provides the, 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 the quantitative dimension, the sort of level of consciousness. So it's as if this was a power supply, as like a television set needs to be plugged in at the wall. Um, the, the reticular activating system is the prerequisite sort of booting up uh, of the system. But the television set itself, uh, the cortex, where the contents and qualities of consciousness are processed, uh, could still be claimed to be the seat of consciousness and the reticular activating system merely as a, um, as a um, power source. This is why it was important to point out that this child is not only conscious in some blank sense of wakefulness without content and quality, but rather uh, that she displays affects. She's emotionally responsive to her baby uh, brother being placed on her lap, just as this child, who also has no cortex, uh, is emotionally responsive. Here you can see uh, she's responding with pleasure uh, to uh, a, a stimulus. And uh, this is quite generally the case for these children. Here's Bjorn Merker's summary uh, of his observations in many, many, many such children. They express pleasure, they smile, they laugh, they show aversion and fussing by arching their backs and crying. Uh, they are, their faces are animated by these emotional states. They build up play sequences, they smile, they giggle, they laugh, they show great excitement, etc., etc., etc. So I've highlighted all of those words uh, to show. Uh, that these two cases that I just showed you with no cortex, um, they are conscious and they are responsive. And in particular, they are emotionally responsive. Um, and on this, uh, I base the claim that these children uh, do have a quality, uh, that con they do have a consciousness and this consciousness does have a quality and it does have content. Many people are perplexed as to how this could happen. Uh, since they have no cortex, 
How, how can they respond to things like their baby brothers being placed in their laps? Uh, and so uh, I just inserted this slide. I don't think I showed it last time. Uh, just to point out that our sensory uh, end organs, here's the example is the eye, same applies to 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 the skin and the and you know to to, to hearing and taste as well. The the the, the uh, uh, optic nerve uh, projects to the lateral geniculate and from there to the visual cortex, but not only to the visual cortex. It also projects subcortically uh, to the superior colliculi of the midbrain of the brain stem. Uh, which is immediately adjacent to the periaqueductal gray, which I said earlier I was going to mention again. So these children receive information in the brain stem, which is not conscious. It's not cognitively conscious perception. Uh, conscious perception is generated in the cortex, but unconscious sensory information goes into the brain stem where it is responded to consciously uh, by the emotional structures. Uh, that that are, are the main focus um, of what I'm talking to you about. Now, um, of course, uh, many of you, uh, and like many of my colleagues, will uh, uh, reasonably say, well, how do you know uh, that there's something it's like to be those children? These might just be reflexes or instincts. Uh, these, these might be uh, the equivalent, these kids, uh, of philosophical zombies. In other words, they look as if they're conscious, they behave as if they're conscious, but we can't know that they're actually conscious. And so last time, uh, I tried to address uh, this, uh, this um, objection by drawing attention to what happens in cases who lose great swathes of their cortex uh, and are able, because they haven't lost all of their cortex, they are able to describe to us what it's like to be them. Uh, this is one way of getting around the objection that because these kids have no cortex and therefore can't uh, declare their conscious states, uh, we can't be sure that they have conscious states. So I focused first of all on a case who has a, a massive lesion of the prefrontal cortex. The reason I did that is because this is a favorite um, part of the cortex for those who claim the cortex is the seat of consciousness, like the global workspace theorists, they say it all comes together in the prefrontal lobes. All of this information that's processed in the posterior cortices is re-represented or accessed uh, in the global workspace. Uh, and this, this is where the sentient being, the subject of the mind, comes about. Uh, and uh, I pointed out last time that if that uh, were the case, then again, we have a falsifiable prediction. Uh, a patient who has no prefrontal cortex, like this patient of mine, uh, patient W, um, he has no prefrontal cortex, uh, but he has a sliver of language cortex. Um, he, if, if his sentient being uh, was, was contingent upon uh, the integrity of prefrontal cortex, uh, he should not have sentient being. Uh, and so I showed you what it's like uh, I talked to him about what it's like to be him. Uh, he claims to be consciously aware of his thoughts. I asked him to imagine something for me, to imagine uh, two dogs and a chicken, uh, to see them in his mind's eye. And then I asked him to count the legs. Uh, I thought this would be a reasonable test of whether he's actually got conscious mental imagery. And please note, the person I'm talking to refers to himself as I. Um, so he seems to think that he exists as a sentient being. And I ask him how many legs there are in total if you have two dogs and one chicken. And to my disappointment, he said eight. Uh, and when I questioned his answer, he answered, he pointed out that in his mind's eye, the dogs had ate the chicken. Uh, so I thought that was uh, maybe not a great joke, but it certainly suggested that there was somebody at home. And I made the point last time uh, that these patients generally, patients with massive frontal lesions, um, that this uh, tendency to make puerile jokes uh, is, is, is considered to be a, a rather a common uh, part of the frontal lobe syndrome or the frontal lobe personality. And this is part of a bigger story that I mentioned last time, which is that these patients are generally quite um, emotionally disinhibited. Uh, and why that's important is because, remember, what we are considering here is the question as to whether the feelings that you saw uh, in those patients, those kids with no cortex, uh, 
you know, where, whether those feelings could be generated in the brain stem. Uh, and the claim of the of, of, of corticocentric theorists, like Joe Ledoux, for example, is that the feelings literally come about uh, when they are registered or re-represented or labeled or even named, uh, some people claim, uh, that it's only once you uh, uh, are, are able to re-represent this, uh, this, uh, uh, these subcortical uh, survival uh, circuits uh, in uh, 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 declarative consciousness uh, in, in prefrontal lobes, that this is literally what brings the feeling about. And I think it's quite interesting that these patients who have no prefrontal cortex um, don't have a dearth of feeling, which is what you would expect if the machinery that brings feelings about is absent, uh, then they shouldn't be able to have feelings. But in fact, what is generally accepted is these patients have an excess of feelings. Uh, there, there, there's disinhibited emotionality in these patients. Um, I, I'm, I made much the same argument about uh, uh, the, the, the other uh, major cortical area that is associated uh, with the sentient self, uh, and that is the insular cortex. Of course, this is associated above all with the work of Bud Craig, but has been very widely accepted uh, that the feeling self comes about um, when um, when uh, one's the state of one's uh, interceptive uh, body uh, is 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 uh, re-represented in insular cortex, and uh, so again we have a falsifiable prediction. Uh, if you take a case who has no insular cortex, like this patient of Damasio's, uh, then there should be no sentient self uh, uh, present. And uh, in, I showed you this interview where Damasio speaks to him about his sense of self, and the patient uh, is perfectly adamant that he exists as a self. He speaks about himself as I, I, you know. Uh, and it, it ends, this interview ends with Damasio saying, you're aware that I'm aware, and the patient B says, I'm aware that you're aware that I'm aware. You know, all, and, and this patient, just like my patient W, um, is not... Uh, deficient in emotionality. Uh, in fact, uh, all the basic emotions are present, including uh, both bodily affects and emotional affects and sensory affects. And um, uh, not only that, he's also a little too emotional. Uh, and this is a little disinhibited in his emotionality. And this is what we quite generally see with patients uh, with insular lesions. So again, it's very hard to sustain the argument that the self actually comes uh, into being uh, in the cortex. Um, now, of course, those two cases, those e examples of their kinds, patients with massive frontal cortical lesions, passive, patients with massive insular lesions, of course, they are uh, just examples. Uh, but uh, the point is, uh, the point I'm making now is that uh, the, th there's lots of cortex left in those cases. Uh, so th the argument is, well, you know, maybe this, the sentient subject uh, is generated in the remainder of their cortex. And that's a bit of a, that's a, bit of a circular argument because, remember, um, you know, the, the, the children who have no cortex, um, we're told, well, how do we know uh, that, they, that they're conscious, they can't report their conscious states? I then gave these two outstanding examples looking at the areas of cortex that are most bound up uh, uh, with with a sentient subjectivity, according to cortical theories of consciousness, and uh, these patients uh, seem to have uh, intact uh, sentient subjectivity. But now I'm told, well, you know, the remainder of the cortex uh, might be what's what's generating the consciousness. So uh, we can't use only lesion methods. There's no way out of that impasse. And so I then showed you last time uh, evidence of a different kind. Um, I showed you what happens if you stimulate reticular activating system nuclei. Uh, there again, there's, a, there's a, a, an easily uh, 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 tested prediction. Uh, the prediction is that if these brainstem nuclei, the reticular activating system and periaqueductal gray, as I'm claiming, if these are the structures that generate consciousness uh, and feeling, uh, then stimulation of these structures should stimulate conscious feelings. Um, and I showed you that he has a case who had a deep brain stimulator placed into the substantia nigra, 
this, this part of her reticular activating system. And within five seconds, uh, it, 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 it uh, generated, uh, it produced a, a profound depression. Uh, the, the patient was actually suicidal. Uh, she didn't want to live anymore. This is a patient with no psychiatric history. Um, the, the electrode was placed in her brainstem for the treatment of Parkinson's disease um, and, uh, and stimulated the wrong nucleus. And that's how uh, this came about. Uh, 90 seconds after the, the, the stimulator was switched off, uh, the depressed feeling disappeared. And uh, the patient generously agreed to allow uh, for further stimulation uh, in the uh, reticular activating system and out of it. And it was only when that particular nucleus was stimulated uh, that, uh, that uh, she fell into the depression. So this is the kind of evidence. And remember, again, I'm just giving you examples. Uh, you can stimulate intense affective states by stimulating reticular activating nuclei um, and periaqueductal gray. You get the greatest intensity and the greatest variety of affects from stimulating there, um, and you get nothing of the kind from stimulating cortex. So uh, this is a, a different line of evidence suggesting that feelings are actually generated um, in the upper brain stem. And then I showed you another line of evidence uh, that was positron emission tomography um, of people in intense affective states. Uh, here you see uh, uh, research participants in, in, in states of sadness, here of anger, here of happiness, here of fear. And in all instances, the activation uh, is in the brain stem uh, and the circuits arising from it, the subcortical circuits arising from it. Uh, that's what we see. Um, the cortex uh, is, uh, 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 by contrast, largely deactivated. So uh, this is a further line of evidence that the, you know, an, an entirely different line of evidence. Remember, we've got lesion evidence, then we've got deep brain stimulation evidence. Here we've got positron emission imaging uh, 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 evidence that the part of the brain that's generating the feelings is the part of the brain that switches on the lights. Uh, and this is why I'm claiming that the basic, uh, the foundational form of consciousness, uh, this prerequisite form is affect. Affect is the elemental form of consciousness. Uh, a further line of evidence is pharmacological manipulations. Um, if you tinker with the neuromodulators uh, that are sourced in these reticular activating nuclei, like, for example, noradrenaline uh, or serotonin, or dopamine, all of which are sourced in the reticular activating system. Uh, uh, serotonin is, of course, regularly um, uh, pharmacologically manipulated for the treatment of depression, uh, dopamine for the treatment of psychosis, uh, noradrenaline for the treatment of anxiety. Um, noradrenaline uh, is sourced in locus ceruleus complex, serotonin in the RAFE nuclei, dopamine, at least the one that's important for psychosis in the ventral tegmental area. All of these are parts of the reticular activating system. If, if all that this system did was switch on blank wakefulness, it might be of interest to anesthetists. Uh, but uh, in fact, it's a, it is the main target of the drugs uh, of psychiatrists uh, who are treating emotional disorders by manipulating the chemistries uh, that are uh, the source nuclei for which uh, are in the reticular activating system. So uh, on the basis of all of that, uh, I argued, remember, that affect is the foundational form of consciousness and it's intrinsically conscious. I said that feelings, uh, we don't own, not only on semantic grounds, uh, I'm saying that feeling is the basic form of consciousness. The reason I'm saying that is because the basic consciousness generating tissues of the brain, the reticular activating system, uh, which is prerequisite for the activation of consciousness in cortex, uh, that, this, uh, that these structures generate feeling. Uh, that feeling, therefore, is prerequisite, is foundational for all forms of consciousness. I then made, a, 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 this is a sort of a sidebar, um, the reason I went into this third point um, is that, na namely that the claim that affect is not synonymous with interoceptive inference. Uh, in other words, that it's not just an interoceptive form of perception, 
um, you know, uh, as opposed to the extra receptor forms, which have been the major focus uh, of consciousness studies over the last few decades, um, uh, vision being the main focus. Uh, I'm saying that affect is not, and, and why I say this is because this is increasingly being argued. Um, in fact, it was argued by Bud Craig himself uh, that affect is just interoceptive perception. Uh, it, 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 uh, the perception of the state of the own body um, is the equivalent of the perception uh, of the outside world uh, in the more uh, typical form or extraceptive form of perception that's been equated with consciousness. I made the point that there's that there's good reason to believe that affect isn't just a sixth uh, modality of perception. Um, and uh, the evidence that I presented for that was uh, of various kinds. Uh, for example, that there are affects which are clearly not interoceptive. For example, getting a fright uh, or being startled. Um, or feeling pain when 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 you, you you a pin is stuck into your finger. These are all extra receptive uh, uh, forms of stimulation, and yet they arouse affective responses. So um, affect clearly is not uniquely interoceptive. And then I also made the point that there are many interoceptive perceptual states which are not affective. You can feel your tummy grumbling, or you can feel your heart beating or you can feel your your your, your lungs expanding uh, these are not intrinsically affective phenomena so interoceptive perception can happen without affect and affect uh, can happen without interoceptive perception um, so i was trying to draw a line under the idea that affect is just another modality of perception uh, I, I i think that by uh, detaching affect from perception uh, casts some new light on the hard problem. And so that's where I went next. Uh, and I reminded you that David Chalmers, who coined the hard problem, uh, said that uh, when we look at um, functions, uh, perceptual functions like vision, uh, which was, as I said, the model example uh, derived from the, or, or grounded upon the assumption uh, that consciousness is a cortical phenomenon. Um, cortical vision became the model example of consciousness. This was following Crick's um, initiative in the mid 1990s. Uh, Crick's idea was that if we can if we can identify the neural correlate of consciousness in the case of cortical vision, uh, then we can generalize from that uh, uh, the, the, by, by 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 discerning the mechanism whereby. Uh, uh, visual information processing uh, gets turned into conscious vision in the cortex. By isolating that mechanism, uh, we will be able to uh, understand uh, the, 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 the nature and function of consciousness. And Chalmers said that that's not true. Um, you, if, you, if you isolate, uh, uh, identify the mechanism uh, of visual information processing uh, like this map here does, it doesn't tell you anything about why there's something it is like to see. Um, and uh, he, he used the well-known knowledge argument of Frank Jackson, um, the, the story about, uh, about Mary, the visual neuroscientist, who knows everything about uh, all of this. Uh, and I slightly simplify the story by saying, well, let's, let's imagine that Mary is blind, um, even though she knows everything about the functions of cortical vision, she knows everything about the mechanism uh, whereby visual information is processed in the cortex. Because she's blind, she knows nothing about what it is like to see. And if she were to be um, gifted uh, 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 suddenly with a normal uh, sight, uh, then she would learn something completely new about vision. She would learn what it is like to see red and blue, what blueness and redness, etc., are like. Uh, none of which is accounted for uh, by this uh, information um, processing flow diagram. Uh, none of what she knew about the functional mechanisms of cortical vision uh, would have prepared her for what it is like to see. In other words, there's other, there's there's something some, something else uh, about visual information processing other than the sort of things that mechanistic um, functionalist dissections like this uh, provide us with. 
uh, it doesn't this this mechanistic account doesn't predict what that, that there should be anything that it is like to see and this is the grounds upon which people like Chalmers say uh, that a mechanistic a a, an account of the functional mechanism of uh, uh, cognitive and perceptual processes it doesn't tell us anything about um, why there's something it is like to 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 perform these processes uh, and this is the essence of the hard problem um i said that i thought that uh, this might be uh, because they were looking in the wrong place uh, that visual perception uh, and, and 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 all forms of cortical perception um, and uh, indeed not only uh, perception but learning and cognition more generally that this can readily go on unconsciously um that these are not intrinsically conscious processes uh, that it is perfectly possible to see um, and to recognize faces and to read with comprehension and uh, even to discriminate colors uh, uh, we, these are all uniquely cortical processes and they can all go on uh, uh, in the dark as it were in other words you do not have to be conscious of what you're perceiving uh, in order to perceive it uh, and so uh, this this casts a, a rather different light on Chalmers's point that all of this information processing can go on in the dark. Um, so you know, consciousness uh, can't isn't accounted for by our normal uh, functionalist uh, mechanist mechanistic uh, way of doing uh, cognitive neuroscience. Uh, so I was saying, well, that's because they're looking at functions like perception uh, and functions like learning, uh, which do which are not. Uh, th these are not intrinsically conscious uh, processes. Um, I, 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 I drew your attention to uh, this other statement of Chalmers's from his famous paper, uh, in which he says, in summary, there is no cognitive function such that we can say in advance that explanation of the function will automatically explain experience. And my point was, well, that's because they're talking about cognitive functions. Uh, could Chalmers make the same statement? if we were talking about affective functions. I'm saying, no, he could not. I'm saying that we can say in advance that explanation of the function of feeling will automatically explain experience because the function of feeling is to feel. It's intrinsically conscious uh, is, this, is this function. Uh, unlike vision uh, and perception in general and cognition as a whole, none of that is intrinsically conscious. But feeling, affective feeling, is intrinsically conscious. You could not understand uh, the mechanism of affective feeling uh, if it didn't account for why it feels like something, because that's the whole bloody point of feeling. Uh, so this question uh, of Chalmers's, why is the performance of these functions accompanied by experience? Why doesn't all this information processing go on in the dark, free of any inner feel? I'm saying that that question is perfectly reasonable uh, when asked of these cognitive functions which are not intrinsically conscious, that kind of information processing can go on in the dark, free of any inner feel, but that is not true of feeling, of affective feeling. And so uh, my claim, and this is where we got to last time, this is uh, now, uh, uh, I'm now starting with uh, new arguments. Uh, my claim is that if we can identify the functional mechanism of affect, of affective feeling, uh, then we will uh, be able to explain why this sort of information processing doesn't go on in the dark. So I hope that that's clear. That's kind of like my main point. My main point is we've been, we've been looking in the wrong place. Uh, we've been looking to cortical vision and cortical perceptual and cognitive processes in general um, in order to isolate the neural correlate of consciousness. And Chalmers has said, well, it doesn't work. You can isolate the mechanism whereby this sort of in, these sorts of information processing goes on, and it doesn't tell you anything about why there is something it is like uh, to see, etc. And so my argument is, yes, that's true of those processes, but it's not true of affect. Affect, uh, the, 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 remember what I've said to you in my summary now today, uh, that this is the most concentrated consciousness generating tissue that there is. The reticular activating system and periaqueductal gray uh, is where the lights are switched on. Uh, and that the, 
you need, uh, you, you can uh, uh, switch those lights off um, with as small a lesion as two cubic millimeters in extent. Uh, so this is the place where we should obviously have been looking in the first place uh, in order to understand, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the, the, to identify the neural correlate of consciousness and to, and to, and to understand its mechanism. Uh, and uh, much more important than that um, is the fact that the kind of consciousness it generates, uh, in that, namely feeling, is it is it is an intrinsically conscious mechanism. That feeling uh, you, it wouldn't exist if it wasn't felt. Uh, and so, uh, unlike vision and 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 learning uh, and cognition in general, which does not does not have to be felt, uh, affect does have to be felt. That's the whole point of affect. So I'm saying that if we could understand the mechanism of affect, in other words, the mechanism whereby feeling comes about, uh, then we might make some progress um, with this hard problem of consciousness. So remember, uh, that's how far we got last time. And now I go on to, uh, and I'm now going to slow down a little bit uh, because I'm now going to uh, argue uh, uh, try to identify what the functional mechanism of affect is. But I thought perhaps before I do that, I should pause for a moment in case there are any questions uh, arising from my summary of my argument so far. With the carry on. Thank you, Mark. Okay. Thanks. So um, my, you see, I'm saying affect is an extended form of homeostasis. Um, and by the way, this is not uh, my um, uh, argument. This is an argument that was first, uh, to my knowledge, first introduced by Jak Panksepp uh, in the 1990s, uh, subsequently uh, 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 popularized uh, by uh, Antonio Damasio. Uh, so I'm, I'm just summarizing um, my version of what is, in fact, now a good 25-year-old uh, uh, argument. A homeostasis um, is probably the most basic biological mechanism. Uh, it's, it could be said that uh, homeostasis uh, is what uh, enables uh, living uh, organisms to resist the second law of thermodynamics. In other words, uh, it is what enables them to be living organisms. Um, they don't just dissipate. Uh, they remain in an organized form. Uh, and the basis of this is homeostasis, um, that uh, rather than just explore all possible states, uh, we living things have to remain within highly specific states. Uh, and uh, these are called the, the, the settling point or the set point, the viable ranges uh, of the organism. And this applies across multiple different parameters. Uh, let me use uh, the example of core body temperature. Um, for those of us who think in degrees Celsius, you know, we have to remain between 36 and a half and 37 and a half degrees Celsius. That's where we need to be. Uh, if, we, if we deviate too far from that very narrow range, uh, then we are at risk of dying. And that doesn't apply only to temperature. It applies to water, uh, to oxygen, uh, to salt, to sugar, uh, to blood pressure, to all sorts of things uh, about our, our, our bodies. They have to remain within very narrow ranges that are viable with the preservation uh, of, our, of our living state. Uh, if we move outside of those ranges, in other words, if we explore all possible uh, states, uh, then we die. Um, so we have to work against that dissipative uh, 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 trend. Uh, as I said, that is uh, this entropic trend. Uh, we have to resist entropy uh, and, and, uh, and remain within our viable states. Uh, very narrow, specific ranges uh, of, of uh, viability across these multiple um, uh, dimensions uh, of, of our physiology. And uh, this is why, why I say that homeostasis uh, is what keeps us alive. Now, uh, a deviation from that settling point then becomes a demand for work. Uh, the organism has to do something to return itself to its viable bounds. 
um, and that's the basic mechanism of homeostasis. That's how all of those uh, autonomic functions I was talking about earlier, um, like uh, core body temperature and bl blood gas balance and so on, that's how they work. Uh, if you're moving outside of your range, uh, you have to do something to return yourself into the range. That is what homeostasis is. It's the, it's the mechanism that returns us back to our viable range. Now, uh, what I'm saying is that affect is an extended form of homeostasis. And how it extends homeostasis is that when we move out of our viable range, we feel it. Uh, we feel an unpleasant quality. Uh, that means I am moving out of my viable range. And by contrast, if you're moving back towards your viable range, you have pleasurable feeling. Um, this seems to be the basic function of affect. It enables the organism to know how it's doing in terms of its organismic viability. So the organism feels when it's moving outside of its viable range as unpleasure, which means this is bad. Um, and it feels moving back towards its viable range, back towards its ideal settling point as pleasure, which means this is good. This predicts my survival. This predicts my demise. So feelings are rooted in a value system. Uh, in other words, that there is something good and there is something bad. And what is good is to survive and as it happens to reproduce. And what is bad is to not do so. This is, of course, the basic value system that underwrites all of life. This is the value system that underwrites natural selection. So the so feelings uh, are rooted in that value system. And what they do is they enable the organism subjectively, the organism itself, to know uh, whether it's moving out of its viable bounds. In other words, whether it's doing something bad within that value system uh, or something good within that value system. That's what feelings do. They enable the organism to know how they are doing within that value system. Now, why, why does this get added to homeostasis? Uh, because not all homeostasis is felt. Uh, most homeostasis is entirely autonomic. Um, I was mentioning earlier uh, blood pressure, for example. Uh, when you move out of your viable range, uh, your heart rate changes uh, and your the, 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 your blood vessels dilate um, in order to um, return you to your viable blood pressure. Uh, uh, you don't need to know. In fact, you do not know anything about it. Uh, in fact, it's clinically notorious how blood pressure regulation works uh, because you can be way out of your viable bounds and know nothing about it. And, and I'm just using blood pressure as an example. Uh, there, uh, there, there, there are many, many, many ways in which your autonomic um, uh, uh, nervous system maintains you within your viable bounds without you knowing anything about it. So why do we need to feel it? Uh, well, the, 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 what feeling adds um, is when you're in a situation of uncertainty, an un a situation where you do not have a readily uh, 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 pre-prepared reflex uh, which returns you to your viable bounds. So you don't need to feel how you're doing if you don't have to make any choices. If you have automatic predictions, uh, which return you by reflex, uh, like in the case of, of blood pressure regulation, uh, to your viable bounds, then you, you the sentient being, uh, have no part to play in the process. Uh, what, what, where, where feeling comes into its own is where the organism finds itself in a state of uncertainty. For example, in a novel situation for which its, its uh, innate um, pre-wired, as it were, reflexes uh, have no, have no uh, preparedness. Um, you find yourself in a state of surprise. And uh, now what you're going to do? Uh, the, 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 if, if there's no reflexive uh, solution available, uh, then... Uh, feeling enables the organism to make choices. Uh, choices have to be rooted in a value system. There has to be a good choice and a bad choice. Otherwise, it's random. So whether you're doing the right thing or the wrong thing um, is, is 
uh, announced to you by how it feels. So this enables voluntary action. I really must emphasize that this enables you to choose. It enables you to decide for yourself what to do. Things are getting worse, uh, so I'm going to change my mind. Things are getting better. I will stick with this uh, policy. This is working. Uh, so these are not these are not hardwired. These are not innate predictions. Uh, these are choices made on the fly by the organism here and now, and they enable the organism to survive in states of uncertainty. In other words, in unpredicted situations. In other words, in novel situations. And God knows there are many of those in life. So. Um, just to put flesh to those bones, let me give you uh, a, an illustrative example. Um, it, it, normally, um, respiratory control is autonomic. Resp you don't need to make any decisions uh, about breathing. It just happens automatically. Uh, so you automatically remain within your viable uh, bounds in terms of uh, the ratio of oxygen uh, to carbon dioxide. Um, but that's only when the normal autonomic reflexes uh, 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 manage the situation because you are in uh, predictable circumstances. Now, imagine that you are in a carbon dioxide filled room. Uh, now, suddenly you move out of your viable bounds, bounds and breathing normally, normal reflexive uh, regulation uh, of, the, of, of your respiratory system doesn't work. Uh, because ordinary breathing uh, in, this, in this carbon dioxide filled room uh, is going to rapidly lead to your demise. So now you've got to do something. You've got to get, you've got to, you've never been in a burning building before, let alone this particular one. So you have no, you have no uh, uh, reflex or instinct, no innate prediction as to what to do. So you feel your way through the situation. Um, and please note at this point, at, at the point when you find yourself in this unexpected situation, this is where this is where your need for oxygen becomes conscious. So this is a very important point. Uh, an, an otherwise autonomic function uh, now becomes a conscious function. Uh, you feel what we call air hunger or, or suffocation alarm, um, and you now you move. Uh, about in this building, uh, deciding which way to go. Remember, you have no, you know, prior knowledge of what to do, uh, and it's only on the basis of how it feels. So, if, for example, you go upstairs uh, and the oxygen supply diminishes, uh, you feel worse uh, air hunger. If you go downstairs and there, there's a greater provision of oxygen, then you feel better. You feel relief from the suffocation alarm. And so the feelings tell you whether what you're doing is working or not. And so uh, your choices uh, are based on feeling. And so you are able to feel your way through this problem uh, and survive. This is not a small advantage. Uh, the ability to survive in unpredicted environments is an enormous adaptive advantage. And so that, we believe, is what the function of feeling is. That's why, in this narrow example, uh, why respiratory control suddenly becomes conscious, uh, that it, that it, that it uh, uh, dramatically intrudes on consciousness suddenly, your need for oxygen. Uh, and the purpose of this is to enable you to calibrate your choices, uh, to, 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 to change your mind, uh, about your policy, your current policy, on the basis of whether it's working or not, uh, the, which, is, which is exactly what feeling announces for you. In the absence of feeling, uh, you would behave randomly, and uh, one in a million uh, will do the right thing, uh, and that one will survive and reproduce, and the rest of you uh, have had it. Uh, so this enables us to make choices within our own lifetimes. We don't have to let natural selection do it. Uh, within our own lifetimes, uh, we can adapt to unpredicted situations. Um, of course, um, once you've done that, uh, you then also can learn from the experience within your own lifetime. And so the next time you find yourself in a burning building, uh, you might, uh, you, on the basis of 
of, of, of learning from experience, uh, you might have somewhat less uncertainty about what to do. So, again, let me just make sure that I'm getting across my main point, because this is the mechanism of feeling. This is the function of feeling. This is what feeling does. This is why the organism must feel it. Now, remember what um, Chalmers had said, uh, that, you know, why doesn't all this information processing go on in the dark and so on? Uh, that was built upon an earlier argument by Tom Nagel, uh, who said an organism has conscious mental states if and only if there is something that it's like to be that organism, something it's like for the organism. Then he went on to say, if we acknowledge that a physical theory of mind must account for the subjective character of experience, we must admit that no presently available conception gives us a clue about how this could be done. So this is what I'm trying to do in this talk. I'm trying to give us a clue about how this could be done. Uh, this is Nagel's way of formulating the hard problem. Why and how is there something it's like to be an organism? Something it's like for the organism? My point is that that question only makes sense in relation to things like visual information processing, which it does not have to be something it is like to, to see. Uh, uh, there does not have to be something it is like uh, to discriminate red from blue. You can do that unconsciously. You, the cortex can do that automatically. That kind of information processing can go on in the dark. But would you would would Chalmers even have asked? I mean, Nagel even have asked this question uh, if we were talking about feeling. I've just explained to you what the function of feeling is, and it makes it kind of absurd to ask why and how is there something it is like to be an organism, something it's like for the organism. Uh, I hope that you can see what I mean. Uh, why? Uh, and how there is something it is like to be an organism, something it is like for the organism, uh, has everything to do uh, with feeling. Uh, feeling is, is what it is like to be an organism. Uh, how you're doing as an organism, uh, how much longer are you going to remain in existence as an organism? Uh, that's what feeling is like, and, 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 and uh, this is why and how uh, it exists. So if we can get to what the physical mechanism, going back to what, to, what, uh, to what Nagel was saying here, he said, if we acknowledge that a physical theory of mind must account for this something it is likeness, uh, then he's saying, we have to admit that we currently have no clue. But I'm saying it's because we've been looking in the wrong place. Uh, I think if we look to feeling uh, and we seek a physical theory of feeling, uh, this will account for the subjective character of experience um, and we will make some progress. Uh, this will provide us some clue about how uh, we might uh, go about solving uh, this hard problem. Now, um, my next point. Oh, so let me pause at that point. Uh, uh, having said that affect is an extended form of homeostasis, that's my next claim. Uh, let's see if anybody wants to argue the toss or make a comment or ask a question. Yeah. So, Stephen, there's no need to raise hand. After each point, we'll take any questions. So go for it, Stephen, and then Dave, if you have anything. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. No, really, really enjoying this. Um, I'm, I'm interested in this awareness that leads to the homeostatic um, sort of correction and if it's where the awareness is with the actual cells or organs struggling in some way to act or inact upon the surprisal so be that in the environment that they're encountering at the different scales so this this issue of actually acting or inacting and when that action and inaction um, can functionally correlate up the nested hierarchies, then it's those actions or the, the inability to act in the way that cells would like that then is becoming the signal of what or where action is failing rather than necessarily a signal of um, that actually contains the information inherently in it. I wonder what your thoughts would be on that. Yes, uh, I agree, if I'm understanding you correctly, uh, I agree with the emphasis on action. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll slightly run ahead of myself uh, if I say this. Um, obviously, a homeostatic deviation 
can also be construed as a prediction error. In other words, what you are, what you are doing has not led to the outcome that was expected. Um, and there are two ways of correcting prediction errors. Um, you, can either, uh, you can either change your prediction uh, or you can change what you're doing in order to bring about the prediction that you had originally. In other words, um, it, when, it comes to, when it comes to prediction error, you can either update the prior and have a posterior prediction, uh, or you've got to do something differently in order to confirm the prior prediction. So that's where the emphasis is on action. Now, why this is so important in relation to homeostasis uh, is that you can't change your prediction about what your viable bounds are. You know, if you expect to be between 36 and a half and 37 and a half degrees Celsius on the basis of acting in a certain way, in other words, um, uh, uh, firing an autonomic reflex, um, and you then find yourself to be at 39 degrees Celsius, you can't say, okay, my posterior prediction is that by doing this, I'll be 39 degrees Celsius. Because if you do that, you're, on the, you're, you're, you're rapidly on the road to death. So, so the emphasis, so the prediction error has to be corrected um, on the basis of changing your action policy, doing something different in order to confirm your prior prediction. So, so the emphasis is very much on action when it comes to these organismic predictions, these, these phenotypic, um, the, 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 the viable states for your phenotype can't be changed. So uh, you 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 can't just up you can't just change your mind about what you expect will flow from your actions. You have to change your actions in order to bring about uh, the expected or, or, or preferred state uh, of your phenotype. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Can I just add one piece to that? I think that's really helpful. Is and also in terms of like multiple scales going down to smaller scales. So. For instance, if I actually feel heat in my body, and my, I, I, my, my body might be, my cells are trying to act to find a better state, that can be seen as oppressive and claustrophobic if I then read that as being me getting into an uncomfortable state. It could also be me basking in the sun on a beach, you know, in the same way that if I taste something that's very sour, there's, a, there's some sort of action at the cell or the, or the organ level reacting to that sourness or that sweetness, which could be like a nice uh, confectionery sweet for a child, you know, like one of these gobstoppers, or it could be quite a, a problem. So I, I think I like what you're saying with action. I'm almost wondering whether that, that action piece is um, the inaction is the prediction error in terms of how it can go up in terms of these these nested hierarchies of, of, of physical scale. Yes. Um, so again, I must be careful not to run ahead of myself too much. I mean, inevitably, you know, you must ask whatever question comes into your mind at any point. But I, I, I'm aware that as I go down this list of, 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 of arguments, I'm going to be addressing those points. So I don't want to make all of those arguments in one go. So I will just say that for now, uh, that, that what you've just asked has, first of all, a lot to do with the fact that we have multiple needs, uh, that there's not only one need, uh, that they have to be balanced in relation to each other. And also, uh, very importantly, that we're talking about a predictive hierarchy, uh, that uh, this is what you're speaking about with reference to scale, uh, that what applies... Uh, at the sensory periphery um, and what applies uh, at the core of the predictive hierarchy um, have different implications for the way that um, that affect works. So I'm just saying those very kind of vague and, and abstract things for now, and I hope that the picture will become clearer as I proceed. Thank you, Mark. Uh, yes, Dave, go for it. Yeah, I don't know how to state this clearly. Um, this is some thinking that I, I got into from listening to a very recent interview you did with um, a young man in another part of Cape Town I'm talking about perception. Um, and I there I think there, and maybe this has already been done, I just haven't run across the research, that there's a larger framework in which these 
notions of what can be perceived, what can be perceived consciously, what is a sensory modality, what we don't call a sense. It seems that there are, on the one hand, uh, conditions, we've been calling those homeostatic conditions, that you can't do anything about. Uh, your body either adjusts the blood pressure internally or it goes haywire, but you can't be aware of it. So we don't think about this as something that we can consciously perceive, and we don't call the mechanisms that are sensitive to blood pressure and uh, uh, core temperature and other things as matters of sensation, matters of perception, matters of consciousness. On the other side, the other side of the mapping, there are single object uh, influences. A, a, a mechanism that is sensitive only to blood pressure presents another reason not to call this a sense. Um, an eye spot just tells a sim certain kinds of worms there's light around here or there isn't light around here no directionality just it's daytime or it isn't i'm under the mud or i'm not under the mud um whereas even a little more information more kinds of information qualify this more as a sensory modality um and in Things like hearing and vision and smell, we have this very rich many to many. There's many things you can do about about many things you can do about a burning smell, and there are many kinds of odors out there. Does this tie into anything you're you've been thinking about? Yes. Um, so the first thing that you're touching on there is the fact that uh, homeostasis is only part of the story. Uh, in fact, this, the, 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 the example I gave earlier uh, of, the, of the person who finds themselves in a carbon dioxide filled room in a burning building, uh, they, they need to maintain uh, their homeostatic blood gas balance, um, but there's nothing that their uh, autonomic uh, nervous system can do about that. They therefore need to turn uh, to, the, to action in the outside world. So when I said that the person starts moving about upstairs and down and then feels, um, uh, is this working or is this not? Is this good or is this bad? Uh, that we call allostasis. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's acting in the outside world in order to return myself to my homeostatic bounds. So that's the first thing I just wanted to make clear. I know it's implicit, uh, 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 and I know I'm telling you something that you know very well, but I just want to make that explicit for for, for uh, uh, our participants that um, what the, the importance of the outside world um, for uh, these internal uh, bodily states, um, the, 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 the bridge from homeostasis to allostasis is how we conceptualize that. So then it moves to the next point, which is that think about those kids that I showed you earlier um, who have no cortex and all they're capable of feeling is their affect. And they don't, they can't, they can't consciously think, I feel like this about that. In other words, they don't know what the about that is. Uh, they, they just feel things uh, and they can't include within their consciousness of the feeling uh, what the thing in the outside world is that contextualizes that feeling. The context doesn't become conscious, only the feeling itself. To be able to extend the feeling onto the context, to be able to say, in effect, uh, I feel like this about that, um, incorporates the context within uh, that um, that. Uh, terrain of uncertainty where one's navigating the one's palpating the uncertainty uh, in order to make choices not only on the basis of blind feeling but also on the basis of what kind of object uh, it brings about this change in my feeling and what kind of object brings about that for all of that to be incorporated within the realm of consciousness i think is a further leap uh, and a clearly another enormous adaptive advantage 
So the first leap is just to be able to feel the consequences of your actions. The second leap is to be able to picture, uh, as it were, uh, your, th those actions within the sphere of consciousness. Uh, and, uh, and in this way, to bring the context into consciousness and extend the realm uh, of choices enormously. Thank you, Mark. And I'll just chime in with a third question. So you mentioned homeostasis is only part of the story. And in the chat, Brock asked, what part of the story is hormesis? I don't know that word. So a small stress inducing like some kind of benefit over the integrated time horizon, like an exercise stress that leads to improved strength. You mentioned allostasis, kind of yes. an anticipatory movement towards uh, a set point. But where does, um, for example, induced stress, mild stress, and recovery play into this extended homeostatic or generalized homeostatic framework? So, um, sorry, I, I didn't understand what you meant. So, the, you know, I think, again, uh, when one gives um, an overview of, a, of, a, of an argument like this, one always oversimplifies uh, what one sort of has to simplify. And, you know, when I say that homeostasis, that, you know, you always have to uh, confirm your prior prediction, uh, that's not entirely true. There are also ways in which the, the, the homeostatic range ca can be extended. Uh, the homeostatic range is, I mean, like, for example, um, uh, you, you know, what I was saying about oxygen, um, you, you, can, you can, if you're a diver, you know, you can learn how to, how to hold your breath and how to manage the stress uh, of being out of your viable blood gas range uh, in, in a way that a naive uh, uh, a person like, like, like I uh, uh, cannot. So there are, there are mechanisms uh, whereby uh, these, th these things can, in very, very narrow limits, uh, these things can be changed. But I think the emphasis there has to fall on the narrow limits. Ultimately, there is there is an outer limit to your viable range, um, and uh, you know this is the driving mechanism uh, of the story that I'm talking about here. Thank you. Of course, so much more to say and learn and add, but please carry on. Thank you. Well, you can see highlighted on the screen now my next point, and it might seem like a small point. Um, it might seem like an obvious point uh, that complex organisms require multiple homeostats. And in, in fact, uh, I've more or less said this already, but I want to make explicit, um, and here uh, is the same slide that you saw a moment ago, where I've just added uh, the point that, I've now, uh, that I'm now making. Uh, the, 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 the importance of this point is that we have multiple needs which must be categorically distinguished from one another. In other words, we can't have a continuous variable called need. Uh, that, that variable has to be factorized uh, across a number of different categories. So let me be clear what I'm talking about. Imagine you have um, if we quantify on a continuous uh, scale uh, how much deviation there is from where you need to be, uh, let's say, okay, I've got, um, I've got six out of ten um, of thirst and I've got four out of ten um, of sleepiness, uh, then all I, that means I've got uh, ten out of twenty of total need. Um, and so all I need to do is sleep. I don't need to drink. Uh, if, I, if I can generalize from that little example, the, the point that I'm trying to make is that, no, that's not true. You have to sleep and you have to drink and you have to eat uh, and you have to defecate and you have to breathe. Uh, you can't just summate all of these and, and bring down the total number. Uh, if you did that, you would die. So uh, we, we have to recognize that each one of these needs has to be met in their own right. Um, and that means we need to know, uh, we can't just have a total variable called need. We need to know which need are we talking about. And this is why 
um, they, they have to be treated as categorical variables. In other words, this here we're talking about how much how much water I'm lacking. Here we're talking about how much oxygen I'm lacking. Here we're talking about how much sleep I'm lacking, etc. Um, so that they can be so that the category of need uh, that the organism finds itself in uh, can be addressed uh, uh, appropriately. The appropriate category needs to be addressed. Uh, and now I know what I'm saying sounds absolutely obvious, but why it's important is that it's because of this, because of the point I've just been making, uh, that hunger feels different from thirst, and thirst feels different from suffocation alarm, and suffocation alarm feels different from sleepiness, and sleepiness feels different from pain, and so on. Because each one of these feelings, um, the, the quality of the feeling, tells us which need uh, is, is uh, at issue. And categorical variables are distinguished qualitatively. So we're not only talking about valence, goodness or badness, and arousal, how much or how little. Uh, we're talking also about ca qualitative categories. Um, and I think that's important when we come uh, back to the uh, uh, the whole point of what I'm talking about, namely qualia, you know, namely uh, the, the, the qualitative stuff uh, of, um, of of what it is like uh, to do anything, be anything. Uh, the, the, those those qualitative distinctions. It's of the essence uh, of consciousness uh, uh, that that it is qualitative. It has qualitative differentiations. It's not just some. Uh, a, a total quantitative, so some total uh, continuous matter of need. It's a matter of different categories of need, uh, which are, therefore are different qualities of need. And I think that's important in terms of understanding what an affect is. An affect is a state of the organism registered by the organism. In other words, it is intrinsically subjective. It has intrinsic value, valence, goodness and badness. Uh, which has existential consequences for the organism. And in addition to that, it has quality. It, it is inherent in the nature of affects uh, that they are qualitatively distinctive from each other. And I hope, I hope that this very simple uh, functional mechanistic reasoning that I've given you as to why that needs to be the case, why that must be the case, um, helps to, to make clear why affects take the form that they do. Uh, remember, what we are doing here is addressing uh, um, uh, Nagel's question about, you know, why is there something it is like to be an organism? And how does it come about uh, that there is something it is like to be an organism for an organism? That something it is likeness um, is not just a valenced goodness and badness, but also a qualitatively differentiated state, subjective state of the organism. Uh, so I think that uh, by by reducing the mechanism of affect to these essential features, we begin to see why it takes the form that it does, why it is a necessarily conscious something in the sense uh, that I'm, the rudimentary sense that I'm defining consciousness. So that's why this point is important. Uh, that's why I wanted to make the point clearly that complex organisms require multiple categorical homeostats they need to be treated as categorical variables. They need to, therefore, be. Uh, they, they need to be qualified. Uh, each of these different factors of need, uh, each of these different categories of need, uh, have to be qualitatively differentiated from each other. And um, this is a, 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 I think, the ground zero uh, of where qualia come from. Now uh, I'll go on to my next point. Um, which is that these different categories of need must be prioritized. Uh, again, uh, I think this is, a, this is in a way an obvious point, uh, but, it's, but I want to just dwell on it for a moment uh, to, 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 to um, draw out some of the, some of the implications of this. Um, I said earlier that our autonomic uh, homeostats run well, autonomically, uh, most of the time. In other words, there are automatic, automatized predictions, uh, which we call reflexes, um, that are uh, that when the 
uh, organism moves out of its viable bounds, uh, then um, it fires these reflexes, which bring it back into its viable bounds. And then I told you that um, not all of our needs can be dealt with that way. Uh, some of them, uh, as we move outside of the range um, of what the um, uh, autonomic reflex can achieve, like, for example, um, in, in, when it comes to thermoregulation, uh, you start to perspire uh, if you get too hot. Uh, this is a reflex. Uh, you start to breathe more shallowly and rapidly. Panting, in other words, that's a reflex. These are autonomic responses to overheating. Then they reach a certain limit. Um, uh, you know that you that they they they, they 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 haven't cooled you down adequately. Uh, so then you've got to do something. Uh, you've got to do something like leave the kitchen. Uh, and that is that is that is uh, what I've just said applies to one of your multiple homeostats. In other words, one of them now requires allostatic action. Uh, you now need to do something in the outside world. And clearly you can't do something in the outside world in relation to all your needs simultaneously. So all the time you're sliding, you know, your 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 hydration, your your water in relation to salt. Uh, content of your body sliding all the time uh, doesn't mean that you're thirsty all the time. Uh, you, you're 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 burning up the the sugars in your adipose tissues all the time. It doesn't mean you're hungry all the time. Um, so the question is, you know, what gets prioritized? Um, and there must be some prioritization because you can't do everything at once. Uh, when it comes to voluntary activity in the outside world, you have to prioritize. There's an action bottleneck. Um, and the point I'm making here is, first of all, just simply that, that you do have to prioritize. And secondly, that what is prioritized is what becomes conscious. In other words, uh, as I gave in the example uh, of suffocation alarm, uh, that that business carries on unconsciously until it becomes prioritized. At that point, it forcibly intrudes on consciousness. Um, my priority now is I need oxygen. Uh, and that's what you feel. The other needs, this is the, uh, the other point I'm making, the other needs don't disappear at that point. They continue to be regulated, but they are regulated automatically. So the prioritization of a need uh, brings that need into the realm of palpating uncertainty. In other words, into the realm of feeling your way through the problem. And uh, the, the, this, I think, is an important, uh, an important part of how, of how feeling works. So let me hear, uh, remember I said I was going to talk about the periaqueductal gray. Um, so, and I was going to tell you how uh, this uh, plays an, uh, as important, if not more important role uh, in the basic machinery of consciousness of the upper brain stem than the reticular activating system. Uh, the periaqueductal gray, um, which is just a 14 millimeter long structure, columnar structure around the central canal of the midbrain, um, all of our homeostatic mechanisms, in other words, all of the multiple homeostats, and we have many, uh, all of the multiple homeostats, all of them send their residual error signal to the periaqueductal gray. The periaqueductal gray is like a final common pathway uh, of all of these um, uh, homeostatic error signals. And it seems that this is where the prioritization must be, must be going on. The, 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 the determining which of the current error signals is the most salient um, then gives rise to, and this is an argument I must again uh, make clear, this is not an argument of, this is not my own novel insight. Uh, this was uh, beautifully argued on comparative anatomical grounds um, uh, by Bjorn Merker uh, in, in, his, in, his, in, in a brilliant paper uh, in Behavioral and Brain Sciences. Uh, so he, he recognized that the periaqueductal gray together with the superior colliculi that I showed you earlier uh, and the midbrain locomotor region, they form what he called a midbrain selection triangle. In other words, this is where the affect, the need uh, that is to be prioritized is selected. Um, and this gives rise 
to a feeling, uh, the feeling being, uh, as in the example uh, that I gave with suffocation alarm, the need that is prioritized, the need that is currently most salient, uh, the need that is going to now color your consciousness, qualify your consciousness in terms of its most rudimentary property, in other words, the feeling, the affect, uh, what state, uh, uh, what organismic state am I in? Uh, I'm in a state of, of respiratory distress. I'm in a state of suffocation alarm. That's what I feel. Why? It's because there. this is where choices need to be made. This is where um, the creature needs to feel, the, the person uh, in that example needs to feel their way through the problem. The other needs remain, but the other needs, the non-prioritized needs, uh, are not raised to the level of feeling. Uh, and, uh, and I hope it's clear why. Um, and we need to understand mechanistically uh, how does all of this work. Um, and that leads to my next point. So before I go to that next point, let me just pause again in case there are any comments or questions about this prioritization function performed by the periaqueductal gray, which is what determines what affective state you're going to be in from one moment to the next. In other words, which need uh, is which need is going to is going to qualify your your your, your affective state. Thank you, Mark. Uh, Dave, then Stephen. Yeah, I just want to throw out there um, in Sylvan Tompkins' later work, that is after 1970, he came to um, elevate reset to the status of a fundamental emotion. And I think it's very relevant to this, the notion of suddenly shifting from one conscious emotion or one conscious activity or world attitude to another. Uh, I, I, I believe uh, Yak Pangsep drew pretty heavily on Tompkins, and the reason that he doesn't cite him in a lot of detail is that he accepted so much of it, kind of like what you said about, uh, I agree almost totally with, um, um, oh, the, the, the uh, Britisher whose father's from India, I'm sorry, I'm blanking on his name, you had a dialogue with him just a few months ago. Um, am I completely wrong about and that? Neil Seth, are you talking about? Neil, yes, thank you. Am I completely wrong? Is just just did this was Tom did Tompkins simply agree? No, with no, that I agree that? with that completely. Tompkins, okay. uh, 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 the reason that Panksepp doesn't cite him uh, uh, or barely ever, he cites him usually in 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 the beginning uh, of a kind of a. Um, general discussion, you know, j just just to say this is the tradition I belong to, and then and then carries on building on on his shoulders. I agree with that very much. Thanks. Thank you, Stephen. <clears throat> yeah, I liked the, when you talked about palpating uncertainty um, and the salience around that. So that that's a nice term, and I think that relates to like what is going on, so to speak. Um, so what about what's going on, and then now what? happens next. And I'm wondering though as well, um, if the idea of where, which I think is often left out, there's a lot of categorization of what things are, but where is it happening? That makes a difference in terms of um, how significant it might be in terms of prioritization. Um, so I was wondering how much um, the risk of the awareness of some sort of disequilibrium happens um, could be featured in, in this. And maybe that's where the physicalization um, and the spatialization becomes much more significant than when you're just dealing with the brain. Yes. So, well, um, all of these homeostatic mechanisms, of course, the, the physiological processes that they regulate are widely distributed. Uh, but the control centers of these homeostats um, are uh, for the most part, uh, in the brain stem broadly defined, um, and, and I say broadly defined because there's some that are in the medulla oblongata and pons, but there's some that are in the midbrain, there's some that are diencephalic. Um, the, the, for example, I mean, to mention the most outstanding example, uh, the hypothalamus is full of homeostatic control centers. Um, but, uh, you know, so, the, so, so hypothalamus, um, uh, circumventricular organs, um, the uh, parabrachial complex, um, the 
um, uh, uh, area postrema, um, the nucleus solitaris, uh, these are all homeostatic control centers, but uh, of fundamental importance. And I, I think it's not sufficiently recognized, although Merck has certainly made much of it, uh, that all of these uh, nuclei that I have just enumerated, uh, they in turn project to the periaqueductal gray. Uh, the periaqueductal gray is, uh, in my view, a meta-homeostat. Meta it's sort of the, 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 dis, the control center of the control centers. And, uh, and that the, the, the essential function there is a prioritization function. What's you know, and, and, and by being able to physically locate uh, these mechanisms, bearing in mind what, where I started, I, I, I started my answer to your question by pointing out that ultimately these homeostats regulate physiological processes which cannot be localized. They are distributed processes par excellence. Uh, but the center, the control center, can be localized. And those control centers, are they are numerous uh, ones. And they, in turn, they all, they all send their residual error signal to periaqueductal gray. That, that is really important. Now, what that enables us then to do uh, is to test models like the one that I'm describing to you. What happens uh, when uh, one or another of these individual uh, homeostatic control centers is lesioned? Uh, what happens uh, when the periaqueductal gray as a whole is lesioned? Uh, what happens, I, I might as well just uh, insert that here, uh, is you get a persistent vegetative state. In other words, uh, you get that condition that um, Magoon and Maruzzi led us to believe uh, uh, is, 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 a, is a theoretical possibility. In other words, blank wakefulness. Uh, remember I said earlier in my summary of what I said last time I spoke uh, that the idea that the reticular activating system uh, provides merely a quantitative level of consciousness and not any quality or content, uh, that that's fictional state of affairs of blank wakefulness, uh, 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 what the, the thing that the reticular activating system was supposed to be producing, which as I've showed you is not the case because all of those different lines of evidence that are summarized show that what the reticular activating system is producing is anything but uh, without quality and without content, that this is in fact uh, the foundational form of the qualities and contents of consciousness, namely the different affects. Uh, if you lesion the periaqueductal gray, then you get that fictional state, that artificial state of blank wakefulness. In other words, uh, the, the, these patients um, show they show non-responsive wakefulness. Uh, they still have the autonomic sleep-waking cycle. In other words, they wake up in the morning and go to sleep at night like those, those hydran and cephalic kids that I showed you. But unlike those kids, they show no emotional, no affective, no, no, no response uh, at, at, at to their situation and no intentionality either. And so, you know, that's... Uh, that's what you would expect uh, would occur uh, if the periaqueductal gray is where uh, the affects are actually being generated. Because remember, that's what I'm saying. I'm saying that the prioritization of a, of a homeostatic error signal is the feeling of that signal. It is the rendering conscious of that signal. Uh, and th that is what we mean by feeling something. It means now, uh, now this need is not just a need. Now this need is a drive. Now this need uh, is driving my voluntary behavior. And that is why it becomes conscious, because as I said to you earlier, voluntary behavior can be defined as the making of choices, uh, as opposed to the executing of automatized predictions. Just to add two uh, notes on that, when hearing Stephen's questions about spatial localization and how that can refer to brain localization as well as like in the peripersonal space. It made me think about how awareness, a awareness, it could be without awareness. Awareness could be spatially dislocated or awareness might be a highly spatialized percept. And then the other note that I wanted to make was um, as a researcher of distributed physiology in the eusocial insect colony, 
this extended homeostatic perspective um, leads to many interesting connections when we think about extended social homeostasis as well. But just two notes and we can carry on. Very good points. So you're saying we can carry on, meaning I can carry on? Whichever way you'd like to. Okay, great. So I'm now going to move to my to my next uh, my next claim, uh, which is which is I see we have half an hour left, so I must I mustn't. It's really quite amazing, you know, because you are so generous with giving your speakers two hours. You lull us into a full sense of security and thinking, well, I can just elaborate as much as I want to. But there's plenty of time. <laughs> and now we're down to our last half hour and I've still got three points to go. So no I'm one, going to... It's, it's like yeah. a, no one goes there anymore. It's too busy. Yeah. Well, I'm uh, again, grateful for the time that you're giving me. So let me move to this point. Um, and this has everything to do uh, with the relationship between affective consciousness and cognitive consciousness. I spoke earlier uh, about, I feel like this about that. In other words, the incorporating of the, uh, of the cognitive domain within uh, the sphere of feeling. Um, and uh, so this is the point that I'm making now. Um, uh, this is a, a, a drawing, that a, a diagram that comes from a paper that I wrote with Carl Friston. Um, and, and, and here, um, uh, uh, I, the, the, the important equation is the third one. Uh, and, and here, this diagram basically is just trying to spell out uh, in, in, in a visual form uh, what, what, the, what these equations are saying. So when I said earlier uh, that um, we have two ways uh, of um, reducing prediction error, uh, uh, when, a, when a prior uh, a prediction does not lead to the sensory state that's expected, uh, then uh, we can either change uh, our perception, uh, in other words, we can change uh, the prediction, uh, or we can change our action. Uh, we can do something differently in order to bring about the prior prediction. So that's what these two equations uh, describe, uh, that we have a generative model uh, which generates predictions um, as to what sensory state will flow from our actions. Um, and uh, so here, so here there's an action in the external world, uh, which is predicted to bring about a certain sensory state. Uh, and to the extent that it does not bring about that sensory state, in other words, the, the difference uh, here uh, is the prediction error. Um, and of course, the prediction error is then used to update the generative model uh, in order to give rise uh, to better predictions uh, in order to better maintain your expected sensory states. I, I, I need to emphasize here, uh, because this was not the case in the early days um, of the predictive processing paradigm uh, that, that Carl Friston and, and, and his colleagues uh, uh, unleashed upon the world, uh, sensory states do not necessarily mean extraceptive sensory states. Uh, so, uh, in the examples that I've been giving uh, in this talk so far, um, th th this would be the equivalent of, for example, core body temperature or blood oxygen level, um, uh, uh, etc. These, uh, the, the, the most important sensory states for the organism um, are its viable states in terms of its homeostatic uh, expectations. So, um, Please remember that when I speak about actions in the world, uh, the, the world that we're talking about here uh, is the can be the visceral body uh, and it can be the external world. Uh, the, 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 the body, the, the mark of blanket, um, it, 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 the, 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 the body is as much external uh, to the blanket uh, as the external world is external to the blanket of the nervous system. Um, I think we've got some, we're in somebody's kitchen here, which you must put, uh, you, you must put your mic, whoever is doing their dishes there. Um, so, so uh, what, what this uh, equation here, which is, which is, which is uh, uh, written in, in, in words here, the rate of change of precision, uh, which is 
which is uh, uh, omega in the equation. Uh, the rate of change of precision over time depends on how much free energy changes when you change precision. This means that precision will look as if it's trying to minimize free energy. The rate of this free energy minimization process is the difference between the inverse precision uh, and the sum of squared prediction errors. So that's this equation here uh, put into words. And the, the, it's, it's foregrounding the, the, the central role that precision plays um, in minimizing prediction error. So um, the, 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 I, I want to be clear that this is precision modulation uh, is, the, in physiological terms, uh, the modulation of postsynaptic gain. So the message passing going on here um, between error signals uh, and, and, and prediction signals um, is modulated by posts. It's, it's the reticular activating system's modulation of that message passing. So it's the increasing or decreasing of the gain on the error signals. That's the role of precision modulation, which is just the same thing as to say that is the role of the reticular activating system. It is modulating the gain uh, in the message passing uh, it, to speak physiologically, uh, to speak computationally. Uh, it is a matter of uh, increasing or decreasing precision values attached to the predictions over the errors. So, this, so to put it uh, in, 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 into different uh, uh, words, um, if things are turning out as expected, uh, that's good. Um, if uncertainty prevails, that's bad. So increasing confidence in a prediction is good. In other words, increasing precision in a prediction is good. Uh, increasing confidence in an error signal is bad. Uh, in other words, uh, uh, the, the, the more uncertainty, the more uh, you, you, you become cl clear that things are not turning out as expected, to that extent, of course, uh, your confidence in your current policy uh, is reduced. Uh, in other words, the precision in your current po policy is reduced, and that just is bad. So the goodness and badness, the pleasure and unpleasure function of precision modulation that I described to you earlier um, is it has this enormously important contribution to make to the whole of this mechanism by determining uh, the influence of the error signal over the predictive model. So to the extent uh, that uh, precision uh, is reduced in the error signal uh, and thereby confidence is maintained in the policy, uh, to that extent, the error signal will or will not um, have influence um, over the parameters um, of the of the predictive model, and uh, so this is trying to illustrate the crucial role that affect plays um, in 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 this whole predictive mechanism. So uh, this is the this is uh, as it were the role of the reticular activating system of the modulation of the message passing that goes on. Um, in the, the these are these are as it were uh, the synaptic transmission mechanisms and these are post synaptic modulatory mechanisms um, and so I'm just wanting to link these formalisms uh, to the affective role uh, that the reticular activating system plays. So uh, this so just to go back to the statement here. The mechanism of perceptual and cognitive consciousness is precision modulation of allostatic prediction errors. In other words, it is the it is the modulation of confidence in a current policy. Uh, in other words, uh, the, the the perceived consequences of a current. Uh, so so as you as the as the uh, a particular need is prioritized, uh, that need is felt. Uh, this generates a category uh, of predictive policies. In other words, this is what I will. This is what I do uh, in this situation, in this context that I find myself in. This is what I expect the consequences will be. Um, in other words, these are my expected, uh, the, 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 and, and there's an expected precision attaching to the error signals. Of course, uh, all the other domains of need, 
Remember what I was saying earlier here about the needs must be prioritized. The other domains have monotonous precisions. So the crucial mechanism in terms of voluntary action uh, is, the, uh, to use the phrase that one of you said you liked earlier, um, is the palpating of the uncertainty. In other words, the palpating of the precision and the adjustment of the confidence in the current perceptual and cognitive, in other words, the allostatic aspect uh, of, of, of what I must do about this need state. Uh, because there's a state of uncertainty that's been prioritized there, uh, there's a changing of one's mind uh, on the fly. Uh, uh, th th this is what this mechanism uh, 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 makes possible. So it is the affects are, as it were, a drive for or a demand uh, for predictive work, for, for mental work. Um, and this, uh, uh, the modulation, the palpating of the confidence in the policy uh, over the error signals is the predictive work so demanded. So in other words, the work of, of updating one's policy, of changing one's mind, uh, it is uh, all of it um, uh, underwritten by the affective demand. So the affect of demand for predictive work uh, is uh, what gives rise to the predictive work itself, which is the palpating of uncertainties uh, in the current policy uh, and the sensory states that it gives rise to. Uh, and so this is changing your mind. In other words, in other words, voluntary action. In other words, the capacity for choice. Um, this is the crucial role that precision modulation plays. Uh, in that process. So um, that's, uh, oh, okay, good. So uh, I, I, I think, I, let me just pause for a moment to see if there are any questions about that, because I wanted to illustrate it with a case, which I think is going to pretty much take us uh, to, to, to the end of our time. So uh, I, before I launch into this last case, uh, let's see if anybody has any questions or comments about that mechanism. I think we'll go to the case, and then there's always so much to unpack with defining the variables and understanding what the edges mean and so on. But I think the case is a good way to close this. Okay. So um, this, is a, this is a patient of mine, um, Mr. S. Um, and he had a meningioma here uh, at the base of his frontal lobes. It was an olfactory sheath meningioma. Um, and it pushed on his optic nerves, and as a result of that, um, he uh, his vision was 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 impaired, um, and this is how the tumor came to uh, attention, and it was successfully surgically resected. Um, now, because of its location uh, in relation, in fact, to the optic nerves, uh, there was some nervousness on the part of the surgeon to remove it in its entirety. In, in fact, uh, he, he felt it was not possible to remove it in its entirety. So he left a little nub of the tumor uh, and uh, this regrew. And so uh, the, the, the patient again uh, uh, noticed these visual difficulties, uh, returned to the surgeon uh, and the operation had to be repeated. Because of scar tissue, uh, the second operation is always trickier than the first. And unfortunately, uh, in the second operation, um, there was a bleed, uh, and that bleed was into the basal forebrain nuclei. Small bleed, but the basal forebrain nuclei are crucial. Um, these are uh, uh, the upper end of the, of the... Remember I was saying earlier that these different parts of the uh, ascending arousal mechanisms of the, of the brain, um, that they that they are the source nuclei for these different neuromodulators. And I spoke of dopamine and noradrenaline and serotonin earlier. Well, uh, the, the, these nuclei uh, are the source nuclei, or, or, or uh, there are other source nuclei for acetylcholine here too, but these are very important source nuclei for acetylcholine. Now remember, all of these, what I was saying earlier about these, uh, these neuromodulatory systems, is that they are modulating postsynaptic gain, which is just the same thing physiologically as to say computationally, they're modulating precision. Now, that's what they do. They up and down regulate the precision uh, in the message passing. 
and this, as I said earlier, uh, it, it dictates, you know, which which messages are going to are, are going to be selected and and which not. So it's a it plays a crucially important role. Uh, does precision modulation um, in cognition and um, and I'm, I'm now wanting to show you this relationship, the relationship between the affective mechanisms that I'm talking about, that is the, the, the affective functions that are performed uh, centrally by periaqueductal gray, and then how this it gives rise to the modulation through these uh, arousal systems uh, of these different neurotransmitter systems. Um, and I'm going to now show you how this worked in this case. Acetylcholine um, modulates the confidence in error signals. And so um, let me just quickly tell you a little bit more about this patient. Um, he, was, he was 56 years old uh, at the time of the second operation. And as a result of the damage to the basal forebrain nuclei um, uh, from the second operation, he woke up uh, from the surgery with a, a condition called confabulatory amnesia. So although uh, the, the tumor was resected successfully and the visual problem was, was, was corrected, uh, he now had this devastating new condition uh, called confabulatory amnesia. Uh, confabulatory amnesia, the patient is, is it's, it's not only that they are um, amnesic, in other words, that they're unable to remember particularly recent events, uh, but there's also quite a, re a long retrograde extension too. In other words, there's quite an impairment of their retrograde memory too. Um, not only do they have this, but they also are not aware uh, of, their, of their memory problems. And so when they draw up, um, uh, when they attempt to retrieve uh, a memory, the, the memory that they retrieve is not the correct one, and they don't realize it's not the correct one. And so uh, they have what appear to be false memories. Uh, these are the confabulations. They frequently are related um, in, 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 in some semantic sense with the target memory, with the memory that they're looking for. Um, they, they, there's some semantic relationship between the memory they find and the one they're looking for, but they can be grossly mis, uh, misplaced in space and time. Uh, and so these are what we call confabulations. And the patient is not sufficiently critical of these um, misrememberings uh, as a result of the, the, the damage to these neuromodulatory mechanisms. So uh, this patient, Mr. S, just to give you one example, I mean, an, an, an extreme example, um, he, uh, he had his operation in Johannesburg, uh, which is in South Africa, which is where uh, I hail from. But um, at, at, that, at the time, uh, I was living and working in London. And so the surgeon who I knew well sent the patient to see me, to consult me in London um, be because I was doing work with this, with this condition, confabulatory amnesia. So the patient arrives in London on a Friday uh, and um, comes to me on the Monday and, um, uh, and uh, has no idea that he's in London because, of course, he doesn't remember the journey. He, he can't remember anything from one minute to the next. And so... Uh, I, I, I say something about, well, you know, the, 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 the surgeon uh, whose name was Mr. Miller, the surgeon referred you uh, to me because of this memory difficulty that you're having. That's why he sent you to London. And he said, London? Uh, what do you mean London? And I said, yes, you know, you're in London. You don't realize it because you don't remember the journey. Uh, you know, that's the whole point. Uh, this is the kind of problem that you're having. And um, he denies it. He says he's not in London. Now, it's so, that, you know, so that's the confabulatory aspect that these patients, the, the, in his memory, uh, he's in Johannesburg. And so he believes he is in Johannesburg. So I point out to him, it was winter uh, and it was, it was snowing outside. I point out to him uh, the, 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 the wintry conditions outside. You never, by the way, have snow in Johannesburg. So I say, look out the window. He looks out, he's absolutely shocked, uh, but then retorts, no. I know I'm in Johannesburg. Just because you're eating pizza doesn't mean you're in Italy. That's what he says to me. So in, in other words, you know, you don't have to, you, you, you know, you, you mustn't overrate the evidence of your senses. Um, and so that's just an extreme example of what I mean by how, how these patients, uh, how, how, 
uh, how them their amnesia uh, it's not just a lack of memory it's also an, an excessive confidence uh, in the in the incorrect memories that they draw up so uh, th that's the that's the background and and I saw this man the whole point of him being referred to me is because I treat such patients and so I, I I then saw him six days a week um, if, 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 at the same time in my outpatient clinic. Uh, at the Royal London Hospital, uh, same time, same place. He came with his wife to the waiting room. Uh, I would then go and collect him, take him up to my consulting room, uh, spend an hour with him, take him back down to the waiting room. And then I would talk to his wife uh, because uh, he, 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 he was so full of uh, confabulations. I needed to verify things um, in order to get some sense uh, of what was going on. And there were certain themes, and this is an interesting thing about these patients, uh, the, the, these confabulatory patients, there's certain themes uh, that returned again and again. Uh, the, the patient was an electronic engineer, but, but he, uh, uh, in reality he was, but he thought the reason he was coming to me frequently, he thought he was coming to me to, to, to uh, because I was consulting him about an electronic problem. Um, and, uh, or otherwise he thought that the two of us were electronic engineers together working on some electronic problem. Uh, uh, it, it, also frequently he thought that he and I were in, in some sporting team together, that we played rugby together uh, or, or we, we were in a, this, a rowing team together. Now his wife told me he had played rugby uh, at university uh, a good 30 years or more before. Um, and likewise, he had he had been a keen rower, uh, but this too was at university more than thirty years before. And so these are again uh, good examples of confabulations. You know, the patient mislocating in space and time a, a memory that that um, he draws up now, uh, and he has too much confidence in that he's too 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 readily um, uh, accepts uh, the, the veracity of of, of, the, of the products of his own memory search. So that's the that's the background. Now, on this particular day that I want to give you a little snippet of a session from, uh, he uh, on this day when I came to the waiting room, he touched the scar on his head, the craniotomy scar on his head, and he said hi, doc, to me. So this was progress. You know, for the first time, he was associating me with medicine, uh, and he was associating me with the surgical scar on his head. And so I thought this was great progress. And so when we got into my consulting room, I said to him, you touched your head when we met in the waiting room. And he said, I think the problem is that a cartridge is missing. We must, we just need the specs. What was it? A C49? Should we order it? So I said to him, what does a C49 cartridge do? He says, memory. It's a memory cartridge, a memory implant. Oh, sorry. I should have mentioned this. His wife told me that he had had dental implants. He'd had serious problems with his teeth, um, and these had been for many years. But the, 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 these problems had finally been successfully treated uh, by implants, uh, teeth implanted into the into the jaws. So when he said uh, that that C49 cartridge is a memory cartridge, uh, and that it's a memory implant, it brought that operation, to the, that dental operation, to my mind. He said, but I never really understood it. In fact. I haven't used it for a good five or six months now. It seems we don't really need it. It was all chopped away by a doctor. What's his name? Dr. Solms, I think. But it seems I don't really need it. The implants work fine. So I said to him, you're aware that something's wrong with your memory, but, and he interrupts me. And he says, yeah, it's not working 100%, but we don't really need it. It was just missing a few beats. The analysis showed there was some C or CO9 missing. Denise brought me here to see a doctor. What's his name again? Dr. Solms or something. And he did one of those heart transplant things. So this is referring to another operation that he'd had, uh, which is clearly also being referred to here, um, which was that he had a cardiac arrhythmia. And uh, so he had a pacemaker fitted, a cardiac pacemaker. So he says, so he did one of those heart transplant things and now it's working fine, never misses a beat. So I said to him, which is what I actually thought, uh, I said, you're aware that something's amiss, that some memories are missing, and of course that's worrying. You hope I can fix it just like those other doctors fixed the problems with your teeth and your heart. 
but you want it so much that you're having difficulty accepting that it's not fixed already. So he goes on and says, oh, I see. Yes, it's not working 100%. And he touches his head. He says, I got knocked on the head, went off the field for a few minutes, but it's fine now. I suppose I shouldn't go back on, but you know me. I don't like going down. So I asked Tim Noakes. Tim Noakes, by the way, is a sports physician in South Africa. He says, so I asked Tim Noakes because I've got the insurance, you know. So why not use it? Why not go to the best? And he said, fine, play on. So um, the, that's the end of the snippet that I wanted to show you. Um, by the way, oh, before I show you about that. So, so this is a case uh, in which due to damage to one of the precision modulating nuclei or, or sets of nuclei, uh, uh, the, in, in this man's case, the basal forebrain nuclei, uh, due to the damage to the acetylcholine uh, 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 um, um, modulating uh, mechanisms uh, that, I sh that, that I showed you earlier. Uh, he has too much confidence in his predictions uh, and too little confidence in the... He does not up the game uh, on the error signal. So he looks, I say to him... His, his predictive model tells him he's in Johannesburg. I say to him, no, you're in London. Uh, look out the window. He looks out the window. Uh, he sees snow, uh, you know, clearly not something that could possibly be uh, as associated with Johannesburg, but he sticks with his prediction. He says, no, I know I'm in Joburg. Uh, just because you're eating pizza, it doesn't mean you're in Italy. Uh, and likewise, uh, in the case of the, the, these memory processes that I showed you in that session, each time uh, that he starts to feel uh, the unpleasure uh, of the mounting error signals, the mounting, the, the, the things are, so just think about it. He has, he touches his head, he's, he's on the brink of being aware uh, that he's, he's had a brain operation, uh, that the brain operation has resulted in loss of memory. I, I hope you can see that, him saying uh, that, uh, I, 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 he says, we just need to order the specs for this module that's missing. What does the module do? It does memory, you know. So touching his head, uh, speaking about operations. So he's on, the, he's on the brink of recognizing that things were not uh, as he expected, that things are, in fact, uh, quite different. Uh, my point being that this evokes feelings, that this is bad. Uh, this, is a, this is a panic-inducing situation. Uh, and because this man has damage to these precision modulation mechanisms that we've been talking about, um, that he, what he does is he simply upregulates uh, the, or, or maintains his confidence in his prediction. And in this way, maintains uh, his, his emotional equanimity, uh, rather than uh, allowing the unpleasant uh, uh, affect to dominate and the unpleasant, ple unpleasant affect uh, to update um, to 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 ink to to upregulate the error signal uh, and uh, and th which would which would normally update the predictive model. So uh, I'm hoping that in this case you can see something of the role of affect, uh, that the role uh, the the feelings involved in this man's case uh, in relation to uh, his predictions uh, and the prediction errors. In other words, the cognitive business um, of what he perceives uh, and what he believes. Uh, and how what he perceives uh, changes what he believes, uh, and the role of feeling in all of this. I thought this was a succinct case to be able to illustrate um, uh, illustrate all of that. Um, the because it's only one case, I thought I should just show you some of this. Uh, these are s several papers that we've written uh, on showing how uh, these uh, mechanisms work in confabulation. Uh, we it's not just this one case. Uh, we were able to show uh, that affect regulation, uh, that that the confab that confabulation has a wishful quality. In other words, it has a down regulating of error signals quality and an up regulating of predictions quality. Uh, and we were we were also able to show uh, that by um, uh, analysis of transcripts of cases like this, uh, we studied many cases like this, uh, how the affect actually improves. Uh, with each confabulation. So there's an increasing negative affect followed by confabulation, uh, followed by an improvement in the affect. So um, I'm, I see I'm right at the end of my time. Uh, I just want to, uh, I, I don't have time to go into this point. I'm sorry. 
this is uh, this is not such a, a, a fundamental point. It's just a slightly different way that I see the predictive hierarchy. Um, if we if we um, take seriously um, that what we're talking about here um, fundamentally. Uh, we're talking about homeostatic systems and that the most important predictions have to do with maintaining your uh, the, the, your phenotypic uh, prior preference distribution, uh, that this has implications for how we conceptualize the predictive hierarchy. Uh, but uh, as I say, we don't have time to go into that. And then the last thing is just to say that uh, these models that, we, that, that I've, I've um, together with my colleagues, derived from the study um, of um, of the neuroscientific evidence um, on the basis of this well-known uh, statement of of uh, uh, Richard Feynman's what I can't create I do not understand uh, we we are uh, trying to instantiate these mechanisms that I described to you earlier in an artificial consciousness um, I'm working with a a, a group of r really great uh, guys, uh, 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 physicists and, and, and computer scientists and, and applied mathematicians. Uh, and we presented our, uh, our, our preliminary findings a, a, a few months ago at um, uh, Carl Friston's theoretical neurobiology uh, meetings. Um, and so watch this space. Um, we, are, we, are, we are saying that uh, if we have identified the mechanism, uh, the causal mechanism where, uh, the, the, whereby affects are generated, what they actually do uh, in relation to um, a self-organizing system, uh, then uh, if this really is how affect is, uh, is generated, if this really is how it is caused, uh, then we should be able to instantiate it uh, in, a, in an artificial system, and, and, and that's what we're, what we're trying to do at the moment. I'm sorry to have rushed at the end, um, but I, if you'll indulge me, uh, I will wait for, if there are any questions, comments, um, I just wanted to show you my, so this is, I'm saying these questions can be, they, they look quite different uh, if we look at it uh, through the lens that I've tried to encourage you to look at it with me through, in other words, through the lens of affect. These questions, why and how is there something it's like to be an organism, something it's like for the organism, and questions like, why is the performance of these functions accompanied by experience? This is Chalmers' question. Why doesn't all this information processing go on in the dark, free of any inner feel? Uh, I'm saying that these questions, uh, I've tried to provide you a clue um, as to how we might be able to address them differently. Um, oh, what happened there? I've lost my... Uh, am I? Good. Okay. Ah, there I am. Yes. Uh, how we might be able to address them differently by looking at them through this lens. Um, sorry to have gone on. My word, I can't believe I've spoken for two hours again. But if, if, you'll, if, if you will allow me, I'll be happy to wait for any further comments and questions before we end. As, as we have actually a whole document of questions and many questions in the chat, I think it's a perfect place to... Um, end the live session and whenever the affordance presents itself we're always happy to have a dot three the numbers keep counting and we'll keep hosting the sessions because this was very fascinating and i hope people got a lot out of it and very tantalizing thank you so much for inviting me and apologies for going on for so long uh, i really enjoyed uh, what little interchange we had over these four hours, I really enjoyed. Thank you so much. Maybe one nice um, future uh, event could be picking up on those last two, which are extremely interesting and important. And then starting with those two, with the dot one and the dot two as prerequisite, and then sharing more about those two um, when the time is right and having that as more of a full discussion. Very good. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Stephen. Thank, Thank you. you, Dave. Thanks, Stephen. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, Daniel. Peace all. Thank Bye. you. Take care. Bye. Bye. All right. Thanks, everybody, for watching. Hope you enjoyed that. See you later.